uh, of these two lectures, we discuss several theorems. And um, in the second part, I would like to describe uh, how to apply these theorems in uh, several contexts, in particular, several models that are usually used in complex systems. Um, before we do that, um, I want to actually to, uh, make clear some remarks that I made in the first part, in particular, when it comes to the conversion to a market chain. I know that now he's gonna cover this part, so I'm gonna go fairly quick uh, in this section. But um, I, I would just wanted to mention what, uh, what is the precise relation between the convergence of the Markov chain and, um, and what is called the teacher coin. Um, so the Markov chains are nothing more, they have, um, for, for, for at least for the sake of this, um, of this uh, discussion, it's um, especially the, this describes hopping on a graph. And uh, you can think of a graph uh, like this one where you have, um, uh, three species, and uh, you think of uh, hopping from one species uh, to another with a certain probability distribution. Okay, uh, if you look at the random walk, um, and basically there are several ways you can do this. Either you do it in continuous or in discrete time. Um, and uh, he, something you might ask is how fast uh, for the continuous type, how fast is the uh, system going to converge to the stationary or asymptotic state. Um, there are several ways of doing this, but uh, if you look at the, if you diagonalize the exponential metrics, you can see that basically uh, you're gonna have um, different rates, um, uh, different eigenvalues that actually control the conversions. Um, it's not too hard to see that then for the continuous process, then the conversion time must be the logarithm in the spectral or the absolute value of the spectral gap, which is what uh, we were discussing yesterday. In the case of a uh, discrete um, or not continuous time, but the discrete steps market chain, then um, you can actually make a bound of the following form, which is uh, the logarithm is up here, and then you're left to be the inverse of the absolute value of the spectral gap. Um, there is a constant which um, um, I know it's, in the, it's discussed in the lecture by Naoki, but the constant is actually um, the proportionality constant of this bound. It's uh, extremely hard to calculate. It usually, this is called the teacher uh, constant. Uh, something I wanted to mention is um, there are some techniques actually to use some very basic um, physics. Um, to actually study the convergence of, um, of a Markov chain. Uh, and in order to do this, let me define um, the heating time, okay? Uh, let's suppose you wanna go from um, a node, uh, let me call this node A, from a node B, um, then how, you know, how many steps uh, for a discrete Markov chain, um, how many steps will, it, will you need in order to go from A to B, okay? And now define also what is called the commute time, uh, which is actually the time that it takes for, for you to go from A to B and then from B to A, okay? Then um, you can map basically the problem of um, this commuting time to a resistive network or electrical network. Suppose you have um, a Markov chain like the one in the graph described here on the left. Uh, what you can do, you can actually map it to a resistive network um, like the one um, on the right uh, with a certain um, uh, voltage applied and uh, with the resistance equal to one. Then there is a beautiful theorem that actually tells you uh, that the commuting time, it's uh, bounded uh, um, from above to, to, to uh, basically the effective resistance between the nodes A and B, okay? And uh, in order to see how these uh, can be applied, let's make a, a very simple example. Suppose uh, you, uh, this is uh, your Markov chain, it's a very trivial one. Um, you wanna go from A to B and B to A. Uh, what is the commute time of, uh, for you to go to A to B? Clearly this is two. But let's make it a bit, um, um, a, a bit less trivial in this sense. Let's assume you have several ways of going to, from A to B. Okay, your, in principle, um, there are several ways in which you can go from A to B, you can go from any of these uh, resistances, so to speak, okay? So how can you show that commuting time is still two? 
Well, we know the rules for the resisting network on how the respective resistance can be, can be calculated. Um, and uh, it's not too hard to see that actually um, the commuted time in this case is actually equal to two. Um, so basically, if you have a resistance in parallel or for this way um, to go from A to B in one step, um, the effective commuting time does not change. Um, why is it, is it important, the commuting time? So this is a way to actually check uh, or bound ergodicity uh, because um, for in order, in order for ergodicity to be valid, which means for you to reach a unique asymptotic state in a macro chain, um, remember that we mentioned the strong uh, connectivity for the graph, which is a, the possibility of you going um, from any node to any node um, in a fact num number of steps. Of course, if you have a committed time, which is infinite, then uh, effectively you are, um, uh, you, the system is not gonna uh, commute, um, relax. Um, something I would like to mention um, as an application of the spectral methods, and um, this is expected, is uh, basically the theory of dynamical systems. In particular, dynamical systems close to a fixed point. Suppose you have a, an equation like the one in 27, um, and suppose that you know a certain configuration uh, or point Y in the phase space of this dynamical system, where you know that the uh, dynamic um, is, uh, uh, let's say it's an equilibrium or an equilibrium point for you. So f of y star is equal to zero. Um, then uh, what you can do, you can introduce the Jacobian of the matrix close to the fixed point, like in equation 29. Um, and if you ask, uh, for instance, uh, what uh, what application these such a fixed point can have, uh, one example is uh, it's going to be in Jacob um uh, lectures on uh, stability of random matrices. So you can always think of equation 27 as equation for a certain population of species um, that are close to the fixed point. And um, here I'm gonna probably skip talking about uh, Robert Mayer results, but basically Robert Mayer results is a way of uh, proving that, um, or showing that uh, if you the size of the matrix uh, or the number of species in your uh, system is big enough, basically you, um, you can drive your system away from a stability point. And uh, this is uh, um, based, based on the idea that the matrix can, can be random uh, or a random ecological system. Okay. Um, so there are some ways in which this simple model can uh, actually describe, uh, linear model can describe certain properties of uh, the species and the ecological metrics. Uh, but what I want to discuss is rather uh, the, the stability of uh, general stability properties of this equation. So if you close to the stability point, um, the, the, the dynamics of uh, perturbations are gonna be described by something of the, along the lines of equation 30, where uh, here I've integrated the dynamics and I assume that um, the city is exponential. So you see that this exponential is very important in many areas of, um, dynamical system. Um, you can slightly generalize this linear equation with a forcing term, okay? And you can show that, uh, like in equation 31, where the forcing now is a vector, um, let me call it U, which is a, an external, external forcing to your system. Then um, you can solve the system by a Laplace transform. And it's not too hard to see that actually the equation, the solution to this equation is uh, the one in, um, the equation 31 is the one in equation 33. Okay, note that um, here I've introduced again the um, exponential matrix um, E to the AT, um, which um, you, you can show that um, there are certain Laplace transform um, identities for which relate basically the exponential of the matrix to the um, uh, resolvent of the matrix A, like in equation 34. Again, this shows the resolvent is important. Um, and most of the lectures, or most of the topics on the second part is gonna be related to the resolvent. Um, one uh, thing that you can show is actually um, exactly what they were saying, that uh, the exponential is, uh, if you write explicitly the Laplace transform, you can actually um, use a Mellon inverse and show that actually 
the exponential has an exact formula um, in terms of Cauchy residues, and which is the, the one of 30, 35. Um, what's interesting is that um, basically the spectral properties of, um, of the resolvent basically directly translate into the asymptotic um, properties of uh, the, the dynamics for linear system. Um, note that um, if you have a finite uh, uh, dynamical system with a finite amount of, uh, um, of uh, uh, say, a vector of dimension n, um, this might seem a rather reductive um, uh, property uh, of a general dynamical system. Since it will not describe all possible dynamical systems because it's a simple linear dynamics. Uh, but um, there is a beautiful theorem that um, is going to be mentioned probably in the lectures by Anatoly Vlotny, which is the fact that uh, if you have a, a nonlinear dynamical system, you can always map it to an infinite dimensional linear dynamical system, which means the equations like the one in 35 and uh, the ones in this slide basically apply, apply to general linear dynamical systems with um, uh, non-trivial statements though that uh, actually instead of looking at the finite uh, matrices if you want, you're looking at infinite dimensional linear operators. But still, if you know the spectral properties, several things um, that we said here are, are gonna apply. And so let's use actually this, this, this fact and actually talk about continuous dynamical systems within this uh, linear approximation. Um, and something you might wonder is, uh, again, how to control perturbations uh, to your dynamical system. And you know, in order to control perturbations, usually you wanna make bounds, lower bounds and up bounds to your um, vectors, um, uh, at, let's say x at that time, t. Okay, so you want, might want to find a bounds on the on x or t, and just by showing how the dynamics uh, the three dynamics for x of t, you uh, can pull out the exponential. And then if you use um, standard bounds for vectors, you can show that actually you can bound it via the bound on the matrix um, e to the ta. Okay, so this shows basically that the properties of e to the ta control um, how, how fast you go to infinity um, or to zero. Okay. Um, some way to show to actually study the the sh short uh, term dynamics um, of uh, this dynamical system is usually via the introduction of what is called the reactivity matrix. Okay. Um, in fact, your matrix not necessarily is going to be symmetric. Um, and if the matrix is non-symmetric, remember you might have uh, some systems that actually are um, non-normal and thus the um, eigenvalues are um, behave non trivially okay? Um, but you can actually show that the derivative of the uh, norm of e to the ta um, is uh, connected to basically this, um, to the reactivity matrix. Um, so it makes sense actually to introduce uh, what, what they call the, what is called the numerical abscissa, which is basically the maximum of the eigenvalues of this uh, reactivity matrix. Um, Something connected to the reactivity matrix is, um, and this is what I mentioned actually at the beginning yesterday, is that um, there are, um, there were over the last 25 years, or basically some advancement in understanding of uh, non normal matrices. And this is uh, what I'm going to talk next, uh, which is pseudo spectra. Okay. Uh, pseudo spectra are, um, a, if you want, a generalization of spectra. Okay. Uh, and the resolvent is actually key in defining this to the spectrum. We're gonna to try to um, describe it in detail um, in the next few slides. Um, remember that we saw that via the Fredholm uh, alternatives, that the only points in which the resolvent is um, uh, infinity in norm are exactly the eigenvalues of uh, the matrix A, like in equation 36. Then it makes sense to uh, general, generalize um, the these and actually introduce what are, what are called level set. Um, you look at um, set um, of um, in which the bound or rather the norm of the i um, of the resolvent 
are actually of order one over that two. And uh, this is basically the scam in 36. If you do that, um, then uh, you, you can actually define the level set. And these are dependent on the uh, number epsilon that you give, okay? But uh, as we will see, the behavior of how the level set change basically describes your transient dynamics for a dynamical system like the one we were just describing into the minor, into the A T. In particular, you can show that um, if the matrix is normal, okay, these level sets are rather trivial, and in fact, they behave like a ball of size epsilon around the eigenvalue, okay. But if the matrix are um, not normal, then these um, level sets actually can wander around in the complex plane. And the way they be, they wander around basically describes, uh, can give some bounds on how the system is going to be transiently um, um, like unstable. Specifically, you can prove certain things uh, like the one in this, uh, in this slide. Suppose that, um, define the following thing, take the eigenvalues of the matrix A and define, um, uh, define what I call uh, the the um, the Christ matrix, the Christ uh, constant, which is uh, the uh, the norm of V divided by the norm of the inverse of V, where V is the eigen the matrix composed by the eigen vectors of A. Okay, then you can show that um, uh, the norm of E to the T A, which controls, if you want, we will let we will see for the perturbations to a matrix A uh, is going to be bound, upper bounded and lower bounded by um, like in equation 40 um, by two numbers. One is um, the Kreis constant K of V, uh, kappa of V, and uh, uh, something we're going to define very soon, which is the uh, pseudo spectral abscissa defined as um, um, alpha of, uh, of the matrix A, okay? Um, you can also apply similar bounds to um, um, to uh, a to the n, and in this case, it's um, again um, it's a radio spectral radius of the operator that defines how fast the perturbations can can grow. Okay, uh, to see the difference between uh, normal and non-normal matrices, uh, in the left um, picture, uh, you see the level sets given epsilon, which is uh, on the bar on the right. Um, how the level set change as you take epsilon very close to zero. For epsilon very close to zero, basically you you see that this go around uh, and circle one, one point. This is exactly the eigenvalue of uh, this matrix. And as you take epsilon bigger and bigger, then these are gonna be both around the epsilon around the eigenvalue. If on the other hand, the matrix is not normal, then you see that these level set are initially uh, very close to the eigenvalue, but can wander around and go around all the eigenvalues. This is the typical property of these level sets that I, I mentioned. So what's interesting is that um, you can uh, make bounds just based on the, on the, um, how, how the, um, the eigenvalues, one, sorry, the level sets are wandering the complex plane. In fact, um, you can lower bound um, the norm of e to the t um, a by uh, the spectral abscissa. The spectral abscissa is basically the rightmost point in the uh, in the complex plane of this level set. Remember, these are dependent on epsilon, which means that, uh, for instance, in these equations, you you need to consider um, changing epsilon and checking where this um, um, Right, most values um, go to. If these become bigger than um, uh, one, then it might be is actually uh, your transient dynamics might be uh, very big, despite the fact that actually the eigenvalue can be negative. So, in fact, um, this is to say that, and we're going to see a picture here, that despite the fact that the asymptotic dynamics, which is controlled by the um, eigenvalues of the matrix, so if they're all negative, Eventually, your perturbations are going to die off. But if the if the pseudo spectral uh, is bigger than one, and, and when you normalize it by epsilon, then you might have some transient dynamics like the one you said before. The initial point in the dynamics is the, basically controlled by uh, the matrix we, defined, we had defined before, 
which is uh, exactly the reactivity that we define here. So you, these define the initial points. So the spectra define uh, the intermediate states um, of the of, you know your dynamics. Meanwhile, the um, uh, asymptotic behavior of the matrix is controlled by the eigenvalues. And again, this is a property of non-normal matrices. For normal matrices, you will see just an exponential fall off. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, how uh, different these transient dynamics can be, for instance, this is um, a normal matrix. You can plot uh, the norm of A to the K. You see that uh, at a certain K, you can have some, the norm going very big and then coming back down. And this is a typical transient behavior, okay? Um, all right, so now that we, we have described these, I uh, probably should say that um, the, to the spectra, you can find some details in the draft uh, of the book, but the original uh, work has been, um, it's in the book by Trevet, and it's in the, I'm going to put them in among the resources uh, for this course. Very good. So here I'm going to discuss about some applications. Um, in particular, uh, one application is uh, sorry, applications of what we discussed over the last hours. Um, so one, one comment is uh, input output models. Um, these are widely used in regional economics and they were introduced by Vasily, Vasily Leontiev. Um, these are basically, imagine uh, industrial network which um, produces uh, some units of certain, uh, think of a car, for instance, that uh, needs um, uh, wheels, and so you you have an interaction between uh, the car industry that needs wheels, and so the A matrix AIJ in equation 42 describes exactly the fact that um, um, you uh, can um, buy wheels both to um, uh, customers or to the auto auto industry, and then if the system is at equilibrium, an equation like 42 must be satisfied. Where di is um, the, the the need of the consumers and aij describes how many wheels the car industry needs. Then uh, think of something like this: di represents the final goods, and so represents all the customers that want to buy um, some items. But I, I, intermediately, some industries might need some um, some of these goods. So you need to, in order to have equilibrium, you need to sort of satisfy equation 42 between the number of outputs. Uh, goods xi and um, the final uh, demand. But then in this case, if you go and invert this equation 42, uh, we go back basically to the resolvent. Okay, and you might uh, actually wonder um, the following thing: given a certain demand um, d, uh, so this is a vector of um, how many wheels are going to be bought eventually by the cust customers. And given the number of outputs x, okay, um, the matrix A, which is called this field the technology matrix, uh, basically describes um, the intermediate case, which means how many uh, cars, uh, how many wheels are going to be bought by the cars industry. Uh, then you need uh, take equilibrium you need to satisfy this different this, this uh, linear equation. But something I wonder is uh, x in principle you would like to be a positive quantity because this is exactly um, uh, the number of goods that are, are going to be produced by an industry uh, J. But uh, the inverse one of the matrix uh, 1 minus A can be in principle be negative. There is nothing that prevents this to happen, despite the fact that A is a positive matrix. What prevents it to happen is, um, this is usually called viable economy, is exactly something that we actually had mentioned before, which is the fact that if D is positive, um, what are the conditions on A such that the outputs are positive? And these are exactly the hawking simon um, conditions that we describe on the uh, minor schematics and A in this case. Okay, so you see that the, this theorem about the spectral properties of A, because the minors are determinants of sub, um, sub matrices on, along the diagonal of N, then um, the possibility of all these um, uh, minors basically describes the positivity of the output to one economy, and so whether that's a healthy economy or not. Okay, so it's a very important application. 
Um, another application of these eigenvalues problems are what are called the Leslie model, which um, describes um, the, the basically the aging of a certain population, um, certain population uh, where n represents the population of a certain age. Imagine humans, age one, two, three, four, five hundred. Um, and F basically describes what they call fertility rate, uh, the reproduction from at a certain age, and P are um, if you want the, sur the survival rate, like how many of these um, uh, people are going to die at a certain age. Okay, uh, and then we study a certain very basic dynamics, which is uh, controlled by the matrix A. So um, A n as a function of time, uh, okay, time step, let's say k, basically. Um, Evolves with certain um, properties that be, uh, defined by A. Um, so uh, again, the number of individuals uh, must satisfy this equation. Um, and and then you might, might wonder, um, so what happens when K becomes very large? How does your population, um, have, uh, if you want, um, age? This is important, for instance, for um, um, Health insurance this is important for insurances in general. So it, it, it is a final interesting question. Uh, something you may watch is, is uh, of course, the very large k limit is described by um, a uh, to the k for very k large. But for positive matrix, we know that Perron Frobenius should apply. And so basically, this tells you that um, uh, the, land, the Perron Frobenius theory applies not only to micro chains. Course, but also to other type of matrices like the one here, and um, and via the study of uh, the parent root, you can actually say whether your um, uh, your population is going to be uh, aging too fast or it, it, everybody's going to die out. Okay. Um, also, similar situation applies in in ecology. For instance, you have um, suppose you have a um, diet. Um, uh, number of species with a certain diet, and think of this diet exactly as in in terms of um, the economy we were discussing before. That uh, certain species can eat um, some other species, and um, and then you might ask, okay, what 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 uh, which which one of these species are um, are um, secondary predator or um, uh, primary predators, which ones are uh, intermediate predators, and so on and so forth. In ecology, there is um, the notion of trophic level, which is described exactly by this equation here, where the demand vector is basically a vector of one. Okay, and um, A here describes the diet, and it could be defined in terms of um, um, calories, it could be defined in terms of um, um, the several properties of the diet, so this, this animals. And N is a vector that uh, is called trophic level, and usually these can be um, valued between one and let's say N, and they it can take fractional values. And the properties of um, of this trophic level so which says how high in an uh, ecosystem your species is, um, basically is described again by the resolvent, uh, which is also in networks it's called central so and so on and so forth. So this is also central and important, you know. In other field. Um, something that uh, I want to mention is uh, how to apply uh, the, these ideas of pseudo spectra that we described in these um, in in this uh, lecture to say stability of matrices. And um, as, as I mentioned before, it is a result by Robert May, which basically says that um, if you have a stochastic um, matrix, which means you uh, Generate random matrices with certain size um, n, uh, with the variance sigma for um, for um, for the random matrix element with a certain say um, sparseness c. Then when um, uh, sigma is greater than a certain value of uh, which is the mean of the um, probability distribution of the elements. Then you know that actually uh, the matrix can develop some instability, meaning that some eigenvalues can be um, greater than one. Okay, uh, pseudo spectra allow you actually to generalize this statement because uh, 
instead of looking at uh, stability only, you can look at uh, pseudo stability for these random matrices by looking at pseudo uh, spectral abscissa, um, like here on this graph, where uh, you see that actually, uh, despite the fact that the, the black dots are certain um, uh, eigenvalues for one of these gen random matrices generated uh, uh, at random with a uh, size of size n, all the eigenvalues are very close to zero, okay? Um, sorry, I meant to positive, not good in the money for, they're very uh, close to zero, uh, but the two spectra abscissa here um, with epsilon worth of 0 0.1, basically can be greater than zero, okay? So even if the matrix is technically stable, um, you can have some instabilities, transient instabilities in this um, dynamics. And uh, some work we did with uh, Philip Stanitzenko uh, not very long ago is actually to show that um, before you actually reach this instability regime, you always should see some uh, transit instability regime, which is exactly um, sigma, which is more than the one predicted by name. Okay, so this is one application of these uh, spectral methods to through the spectral methods to random matrices. So this is the end of my um, lecture for uh, for today. Um, um, I want to give an overview of these spectral methods. Again, you can find um, a lot of results in the book. Um, I know I went very fast in these lectures, but I want to give an overview of the type of uh, results you can, um, uh, you can use in complex systems. Uh, this said, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the, the school. Um, have fun.